Uh, this is our last series in the uh, spiritual warfare series called War. And uh, it's been really good. It's been good for me because we don't talk about this very often uh, in our circle. And it's been eye-opening. We've learned who our enemy is. Uh, we've learned, probably for me, just, just a reiteration of that this battlefield for spiritual war happens in our mind. And the weapons of our warfare are deployed on the field of our mind. Today we're talking about uh, sacrifice. Every war that's fought requires sacrifice on the part of the people participating. I just need you to let that sink in. Doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a personal war, right? If you're in a fight with somebody, you're sacrificing something. Or if it's a national war, if you're in a fight, you're sacrificing something. Every war that's ever been fought has required sacrifice on the part of the people fighting it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Look with me, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 12, begin reading in verse 1. Follow along with me. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that uh, we get to gather, and, and Father, it's exciting and uh, Father, we love seeing each other, and, and God, we, we get to worship, and then we get to open your word, and our goal is to be taught, and Father, to, to make decisions with the truth that we receive that moves us a little bit more toward Christ's likeness, and I pray today that that would happen in all of our lives, and we pray it in the name of Jesus, amen. So what are we fighting for? So in our spiritual war, or any war for that matter, uh, the, the degree to which you are willing to sacrifice is determined by how much you understand about the war. And I'm going to rephrase that even differently. I'm going to use the word love. Is the greater your love when you're involved in warfare, the greater the sacrifice you're willing to give. So today, there, there are wars we aren't even aware of that are happening in our world. Would you agree with me? Yeah, and, and, and you didn't get up this morning and pray for them. You didn't get up and weep for them this morning. You basically didn't even care. Why? How, how could a war that's killing people be happening and you not care? Well, you don't love anybody there. You got nothing invested there. But you let that war come to your house. You let somebody knock on your door and say, we're going to come in and hurt your kids. Now the war doesn't come home. Right? And now you're going to be engaged. And you may be calling people you know and saying, come fight with me. You're, you are willing at that point to shed your own blood to fight the war to protect what you love. Well, the same thing's true spiritually. We won't engage in war that we don't understand what we're fighting for. And there are at least three things that I want to share with you before we get to this that we are fighting for today. Here's the first one. We are fighting to be like Jesus. We are fighting to be like Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 8, we probably refer to it every week when we've been in this series. It, and the scripture says this, your adversary, the devil. It doesn't say the adversary. This is not a blanket statement. This is personal. I want you to look at the person beside you and say, I have an enemy. Right? He's not just some vague enemy that's out there. We've lived most of our life like he's everybody else's enemy. But this is what the Bible says. He's your enemy. He's after you. He's after your kids, your family, your testimony. He wants you, not them, you. And this becomes crazy personal. So how, how is he going to attack us? Well... One of the ways is he wants to keep us from becoming like Jesus. Why is that? Why would that even matter to him? Because that's God's goal for us, right? To be conformed to the image of Christ is what God wants. That every day we're taking a little step toward more Christ-likeness. So here's the deal. Satan's like, if that's what God wants, I want the opposite. I want to stop you from taking any steps or make you tips, take steps backward. That's it. That's it. 
is that he wants to keep us from becoming like Jesus. Now watch this, especially if you're a parent, is that if he can keep us from becoming like Jesus, he can keep the people we influence from becoming like Jesus. Let it sink in. All he has to do in our life is get us to do nothing. Right? As parents, do nothing. Who, who, who do we influence most greatly in our life? We influence our kids. And right, when we pretend like this isn't true or that we're not progressing spiritually or we're not taking steps toward Christ's likeness, the first people and the most influenced people are our children in our lives. And so this is big. This is big. He wants to keep us from becoming like Jesus. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one person receives the, cry, the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable reef. We, an imperishable reef. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself do not be disqualified here's what Paul's saying I go to war look at me with me because I want to be like Jesus right I'm not at war with my mate I'm not at war with my neighbor I'm not at war with my boss at work I go to war with me so that I can be like Jesus and most of us in our lives uh, one of the big struggles we have is long-term sin in our life. So let's make sure we understand what we're talking about. All sin doesn't tempt you. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Um, language has never been a big deal for me. I didn't grow up around people who uh, cursed. So for some reason, it was just never a big deal. Now I told the, the last service, I said, I'll probably curse before the service is over today. <laughs> Because that's how it all works. As soon as you say, you know, this isn't a big deal, then it becomes a big deal. Uh, but long term, it's just... So, so Satan doesn't whisper in my ear, say a bad word, say a bad word, say a bad word. Because it doesn't work. Right? Any, anybody out there, that's not a struggle for you? Bunch of cursors. <laughs> no, yeah. Right? So all I need, first thing I need you to see is just this, is that not every temptation works on you. The devil can lay some stuff in front of you and it will have no impact on your life at all. And you start thinking, I'm doing pretty good pursuing Jesus. And he reaches over and he hits the one sin that so easily besets us. Beep. Reset back to zero. Right? That the, the long-term sin, the stronghold in our life becomes the leverage that Satan uses to keep us from becoming like Jesus. All he's got to do is hit that button again. And we're just like, ah, oh, I get so frustrated. So frustrated with this. Number two, to protect relationships. Almost everyone in the room would value the same relationships. My family, my husband, my wife, my kids, my friends. Um, I need you to understand that in this spiritual war, Satan wants your marriage. He wants your kids. He wants your friends. And if you want to know what he wants for them, it's exactly opposite of what God wants to give them. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Satan doesn't come to bring life. He comes to bring death. The exact opposite of whatever it is God wants. Jesus wants to give you joy. Satan wants to take that joy away. Jesus wants to give you peace. Satan wants to give you chaos. I just need you to understand in your life, but not only your life, your mate's life, right? You got a mate that struggles with this stuff? Pray for them. Kids, our kids are more filled, their lives are more filled with chaos than any generation that has ever lived. Somebody ought to be going, why? What has happened to our kids that, man, they're bouncing off the walls, they're stressed out, their lives are filled with anxiety. What happened? We have an enemy. We have an enemy. I need you to see this, that what you love determines how much you're willing to give up. You see a biblical picture of this. John 15, 13, Jesus says this. Greater love had no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So here it is. The ultimate war that was fought and won was fought and won by Jesus. Why? Greater love. That's it. The love of Jesus determined the amount and the size of the sacrifice. Watch this. 
interesting in light of verse 4 in chapter 12, to the shedding of blood. That he loved us enough that he died. What fueled his fight? Love. Love. Number three, the eternity of others. Uh, We have a personal uh, and we have a relational issue, and now we have an eternal one. Second Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Uh, so, so many of us know and, and love people whose eternities are at stake. At stake. Uh, I need you to see this. Um, what do you pray for them? Right? Because it's like, well, pastor, I pray for them to be saved. How about praying this with me? Pick out those people in your life that you know and you love and go to war spiritually for them and begin praying this. God, I pray that their blinded eyes would be opened. That the deceiver who has blinded their eyes would be bound, their eyes would be opened because I'm going to promise you until their eyes are opened, they can't come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we start praying a very specific, very biblical prayer for those people in our lives that we love. And then number four, if you're unaware of the war, you're already a casualty of the war. Um, If you and I do not take Satan seriously, he will work unhindered in our lives. And if these things matter to you, your personal relationships, your walk with God, uh, the eternal destination of people you love, uh, then the question becomes, what are you willing to give up? I was working on my notes this morning and uh, God brought to mind Luke chapter, uh, our, uh, we're in Hebrews, but he brought to mind Luke chapter 16, verse 27, uh, about how eternity values what we're talking about. You know, this, this passage we read said we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Those people are in eternity. That's not each other. We're not looking at each other's lives. These people who've entered into eternity... And they're watching what's happening here. And there's a glimpse we get of that in Luke chapter 16. It's the the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And and the rich man dies and and goes to hell. And he cries out from hell. He says, "Could could you let Lazarus have a drop? Get this, a drop of water. And let him put it on my tongue to get some relief from this misery. And the answer was no. There's a great gulf between us. And he can't make that trip. And then the rich man said this in verse 27. Listen to this. I beg you, Father, that the most evangelistic guy you and I know is in hell. And it's real. He sees what's at stake. I beg you, Father. That you send him to my father's house because I got five brothers, five brothers, and they don't believe. And let him go with a message. Let him say anything to convince them so they don't have to go through this. You see, it was very clear when you enter eternity what's at stake spiritually in this war. So we've covered that. Now we're going to jump into 12. Hebrews 12, and we're going to look at four realities for our lives about winning this war. What the writer of Hebrews said, these things need to be true. And the first one is this. He said, you want to win, you got to give up personal comfort. Per- personal comfort. Uh, two things that we need to be willing to let go of or lay aside if we're going to win. And the first one is real simple. Will you, are you willing to give up anything that hinders you? And depending on the version of Scripture you read, that word may be encumbrance or hindrance. Uh, but it means the weight that you're carrying that keeps you from running, running your best race. It's pretty simple. If you want to do your best, what do you need to let go of? So the question is super simple. What in your life right now is keeping you from having the best possible relationship with God? That's a simple question. Right? And and I think a a whole lot of us would say this. It's my schedule. Right? I I can't do the Bible reading plan because of my schedule. I can't come to men's group because of my schedule. I can't meet in small group because of my schedule. I can't push into my relationship with God because of my schedule. Listen. What kind of sense does it make... To realize we're in a war and say the reason I can't win is because of my schedule? We don't believe we're in a war. We're not willing to do anything to win the war. 
The second thing the writer says is, will you give up the sin that so easily entangles you? We talked about every one of us has that stronghold. Right, this is what I call the brand that sin has put on you. If you could pull the curtain back and listen to what people say about you when you're not around, this is what they say. He's angry all the time. He talks about women all the time. Sex all the time. Right? You ever, want, you ever, you ever notice how important money is to them? Right? The, this is the brand that is on you that is who you are. It is stamped into your being. And the writer of Hebrews says, are you willing to lay down the thing that so easily causes you to stumble? I believe we all have one. It's not everything, but we all got something. So look at me and, and, and let this question, what, what would you be willing to do to get rid of that? I mean, if everything we talk about is true, then we believe that in a God that has the power to set us free, right? Then why aren't we? Could it be that we're not willing to set aside the sin that so easily entangles? Why does all this matter? Um, well, what happens when we get comfortable with the sin is we get to the place in our life uh, where we just decide to live with it. Look, I... I I have in my own life. And you got to look at your life and you got to realize, man, what have, you got, what have you gotten so comfortable with that you're just living with it? Is it your temperament? Right? Is it your indulgences? What is it that you've looked at and you thought, well, even Pastor Rick says everybody's got something. This is just my thing. I'm just living with it. Well, here's, what, well, here's the danger of that. When, when we get comfortable, our comforts are the door that provides Satan entry into our home. I'm just comfortable with what I watch. Do you understand that what you watch is the door that Satan's coming into your home through? I'm just comfortable with what I listen to, how I talk, what I laugh about. Understand that that's the doorway that Satan uses to get entrance into our homes. To influence our families. And are you willing to give up what you're comfortable with for your family? Number two, are you willing to pay the price of perseverance? And the writer of Hebrews says, run with endurance the race that is set before us. We are a people who culturally have become almost addicted to our next time off. Do you realize that for years and years and years, every American you and I know has worked toward one point in life? Retirement. I can't wait to get to the day I can quit. And so that's trickled down now. Watch this, because now everybody's getting all uncomfortable with me. So if you're not waiting on retirement, what are you waiting on? Vacation. And if you're not waiting on vacation, you're waiting on the weekend. And I'm going to show you what every one of them look like. They look like I quit. You say, I don't think so. You take your Bible reading plan on vacation? Or do you just take a break? You get up when, when you're off, you get up and spend time with God, or you just take a break? Oh, that's right. There is that verse that tells us Satan gives us two weeks off every year, right? <laughs> oh, it doesn't? Then why are we taking breaks? Listen, somebody wants everything you value, and we're playing games with him. We're playing games with him. There is never a time. There are three things I, I, I need you to know about this war. First of all, this is not a fast war. It's not a three-day war. It's not a seven-day war. The longest war that has ever happened in human history is called the Reconquista. 781 years. It's a long war. But the war that you and I fight spiritually has been brewing since the dawn of time. Secondly, there will be a, never be a time in your life when you don't have a target on you. Never, 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 never. Your enemy has been warring for thousands of years. He's very patient. He will wait until you take your break, till you have a bad day, till you fight with your mate, and he will move in. Ask the question, why is this happening? Because your enemy is a genius at defeating you. Third thing. 
you're going to die fighting. Look right up here, especially if you're young. This war never ends. Something in our head says, when I get old, I won't be fighting anymore. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. It doesn't stop when you're 60. It doesn't stop when you're 70. I'll tell you when it stops. It stops the day you die. Then you win. Then you win. You go, well, that's kind of depressing. That's reality. You've been sold a bill of goods about what Christianity looks like, and this hadn't been part of it. Fight. What's that great crowd of witnesses saying that's surrounding you? They're looking in that arena, and you want to quit, and what are they saying? Fight, fight, fight. Don't quit. Get up. Last point. Second to last point. Are you willing to pursue Jesus? Um, we fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. Uh, our weapons that we fight with are all spiritual. And if we're not developing our spiritual relationship with Jesus, we're losing this fight. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot keep saying, I don't have time for Jesus. We will lose. We will lose. We cannot survive spiritually on 28 minutes a week of this. We will lose. A few weeks ago, Zach Worth was preaching and... Uh, he made a comment in his message. He said, um, a lot of us get concerned about the big things like God calling us to Africa. And he said, what we need to be concerned with is the daily small things like spending 30 minutes with God. And I wrote that down. I thought, you know, if we're not spending 30 minutes with God, I got news for you. God don't want you in Africa. And so let's just back up a little bit. Let's try to spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, wherever you're at. Let's try to spend some time a day building resources so that we have something to fight this war with. Otherwise, we're done. We're beaten. Last point. Are you willing to do anything to win? Two verses. Ephesians 6.13 says, having done everything, stand, right? I was talking to the guy before the service started. I asked him how I could pray for him. And this is what he said. It's a genius prayer. He said, pray I don't go backwards. Every one of us in the room want to be praying that. I don't want to go backwards. That's what that verse means. Having done everything, just stand. Don't give up ground. But the one that got me is verse 4 in this. You have not resisted to the point of bleeding in your fight against sin. I don't know anybody who ever resisted to the point of bleeding. I'm going to say it this way. I don't think I ever knew anybody who took it that serious. Something happens in a fight when we bleed. Um, a lot of people like to fight until it's their own blood they see and taste. And man, something shuts us down when we start bleeding. Let me ask you a question. Are you bleeding spiritually today? Have you been pummeled by Satan to the point that when you look in the mirror, you see your own blood, you taste your own blood, and you're like, I'm out. I can't fight no more. I'm done. I want you to watch a video clip uh, uh, out of the movie Cinderella Man. Um, every man in the room ought to go watch Cinderella Man. It is a great what it means to be a man movie. But it's the story of James J. Braddock. He was a fighter during the Depression. Um, he, was, he was an okay fighter. He broke his hand. It put him out of fighting for a while. He was actually took his license away to fight. But he had to go work on the docks and didn't make enough money. And he, his wife had to send her kids away, right? And so he comes home and the kids are gone. And he's like, this is, this is not the life I'm living. And he decides, he goes back and he begs to get reinstated in the boxing world. And they, they, they bring him back, but they bring him back kind of as a stooge. Uh, that we will put you in the ring with the up-and-coming guys and let them beat the dog out of you to build their record up and their reputation up. Because the champion of the world at that time was a guy named Max Bear. Max Bear hit so hard, he hit a man in the head and killed him in the ring. Okay, dislodged his brain when he hit him and the guy dies. Everybody's afraid to fight Max Bear. And the boxing world's looking for one dude, one dude. Who can go fight that battle? 
And so they, they cast James J. Braddock in this fight, and, and he wins the first one, and the boxing world is shocked. And all the common people start to cheer for him. And they set him up to fight a guy named Art Lasky. And Art Lasky was in line. The next guy, after this fight, he's fighting Max Baer. And, and Art Lasky is doing a number on James J. Braddock. And in this clip you're going to see, James Braddock's going to bleed. But when he tastes his blood, it doesn't make him quit. It makes him fight. Watch. So I want you to notice a couple things. Number one, did you see the great crowd of witnesses? They were screaming, fight, get up, don't quit, fight, fight. So at the point in his life when it looked like he was beating, here's what I need you to see. What did he remember? He remembered his family. His kids who didn't have food to eat. His wife who had to give his kids to somebody else to raise, what it was like to stand in a bread line, what it was like to not be able to pay your bills. He remembered the crud of life. And he looked at his enemy and he smiled. He smiled. I want to ask you to do something right now. Because I do believe we get bloodied and we get battered in our fight and we get tired. And I need you to remember that there's a host of eternal people who are saying, don't quit. Don't quit. You don't understand what's at stake. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. But I need you to see what you're fighting for. I need to see your kids. Your marriage. The people you love that do not know Jesus. That there's a lot at stake. What are you willing to give up to win? Would you bow your heads with us? I, uh, I was doing my Bible reading time this week, and we're in Isaiah 6, and Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and behold, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he said, uh, who shall I send? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And God said, okay, here's your deal, Isaiah. You're going to go preach, and nobody's going to listen. Nobody's going to respond. You're going to do it for not weeks, not months, but years, years and years. And I wrote in my journal that day, I'm thankful that God gives me the privilege to stand and open the word with people who, who do care. Who do want to change, who do want to be like Jesus. Who are constantly looking at their life and asking the question, what do I need to do? How do I take my next step? How do I win this war? So right now, what is your next step? Maybe it's the first step. Maybe through this series, you've realized you didn't know Jesus at all. And you need to take that step. You've known it for a while now. Maybe today's the day. Or maybe it's a step of obedience. Maybe you've never been obedient to be baptized. And right now, God's saying, you know, you need to take care of it. Would you just step out? Or plant your life at a church to become part of a spiritual army that fights with you. Or maybe it's something as simple as pick up that new quarter of the BRP and start today. Start today. Start reading. Start growing. Or start again. What would God be saying to you? Maybe he's saying, listen, go ask one of the ministers to pray with you about what you're fighting. Quit fighting alone. Victor and Matthew are going to be here with me, man. This, this is our time, our response time. You do what God wants you to do, what he brought you here to do today. Father, thank you so much that you've loved and moved and worked today already. And we look forward to what you're going to do now. God, give your people freedom, freedom to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?